right, so I'm here with the creator, the mastermind, the author, Mr. Richard Curtis. Hi, everybody. And I'm with Steve Mecca, uh, who, uh, who performed uh, the role uh, of uh, Leland uh, in You've Got a Guest, and is also uh, the technical director, sound uh, sound manager, and I have to say, producer of this show, without whom this could not have been done. We thought it might be uh, interesting. I always, I love speaking to actors um, about the process, and um, and perhaps you might be interested to hear from an author or a playwright as to how uh, how these things develop. Um, and uh, I might as well talk to you about uh, you have a guest. Um, I'm not going to give away the ending in case there are people watching who have not yet seen it. Um, so you'll see if I can work around it and still give you a sense of, of, uh, of, of how this is going to work. Uh, the idea behind it was that a man has made he makes a kind of Faustian bargain with the devil. Uh, he has sworn, uh, taken an oath on somebody's life that he has not had an affair with his wife's sister. Um, and now he's being held to that oath. Um, the oath has to do not with, I swear, on a stack of Bibles, but I swear on somebody's life. And the genesis of that, the idea for this play, was that when I reached a certain round number birthday, I began to wish that I had 20 years back. Um, and I began to ruminate as to what I would, what I would wish, what I would trade uh, if Faust, in a Faustian bargain, what I would trade to get those 20 years back. And as a playwright, I realized it had to be something extreme. So I picked somebody's life, somebody who would be very, very dear to the person uh, longing, or at least the person in this case, swearing that he's innocent of something. And he is innocent, um, but the, the, uh, because technically, um, he has only thought of doing something. He has not done it yet. So that was the basis for the play. I thought about this play for about five years, and I couldn't write it, first of all, because I couldn't bring myself to, uh, to write about something that I, was, uh, that I superstitiously thought, if I uttered it out loud, if I wrote about it, that person could actually die. So I couldn't write it until I found a solution for that particular paradox. The second solution, which came to me uh, uh, very late, but enabled me to write the play, was um, that this is about coveting somebody else's wife. Now, the 10th commandment in the Bible is that you shall not covet somebody else's wife. Oh, your neighbor's wife. Um, and and it, it's in the Bible, which means that it is a sin to covet. And yet in our Judeo-Christian uh, society, we do not have thought police. We do not punish people for thinking, wishing, coveting. We only co punish them for their deeds, or we, we weigh their behavior only by their deeds, not by their thoughts. A couple of years ago, uh, 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 former President Jimmy Carter uh, scandalized the nation when he admitted that he had committed adultery many times in his heart. And you know, a, you know this is a big evangelical uh, brouhaha because uh, it got people to thinking, well, you know, is that, is that a form of adultery? or it doesn't it count? Uh, so that was the other problem I had to solve, is how to shift the attention from our attention from 
I did a deed for which I should be punished is I was thinking of a deed and that doesn't count. Why should I be punished? So uh, I think that would be interesting to uh, readers to, to think about that particular paradox. Yeah. I can tell you what, when I was going through the episode as I was editing it, you know, I mean, I probably listened to it at least 30 times and you know, it's, Every time, no matter what I'm doing, no matter what I'm working on, whether it's an EQ or especially the music, particularly, that lets me get into that, you know, into that headspace. Sorry, there, there are dogs out here. Uh, get into that headspace. And um, yeah, it's, it's like a, it, it never fails to kind of penetrate and, and make you think. It's really interesting. Um, uh, as an actor, performing this role. How deeply did you get into it? Did I always wonder whether actors feel, uh, enter into the part, inhabit the role, as they say about actors, or were you always aware that, hey, I'm an actor, I'll do the best I can, but I'm, I'm not emotionally touched by uh, this, this job that I have to do right. of bringing this bad news to this, this, this poor man? Well, in my role, the the main, I guess the main uh, approach was to not feel anything for the guy because it's my job. It's, you know, it's like, you know, it's almost like, uh, like checking out groceries at a, at a, you know, I had to like really remove the, the reactionary. And I know you made a note before we even started recording. It was like, you know, he's very straight. And, and I said, play it straight. You asked me, how, how should I do this? Because uh, in your diabolical role, you could have been very spooky wooky right. um, and arch and diabolical. Um, and basically I said, this is, a, this is a business proposition. You're delivering a decision. Uh, you know, it's a, like a, you're just a messenger delivering news and you've delivered this to other people many times. So I just said, play it straight, which you did beautifully. Thank you. Um, uh, and it just enhances the, uh, the, the, the creepy aspect of it because um, you would expect something of flames and haunting right, right. Uh, you know, all kinds of haunty music and everything. The music, by the way, as long as we're talking about it, tell us about the music and your challenges as a sound engineer. We're going to be doing, having these conversations over the next uh, 11 episodes and this may come up again because there are musical and sound challenges in some of these episodes that are more intense than perhaps than others. So what, were there any particular challenges uh, here as you produce this uh, that we should be interested in? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say across the board, it's, it's the, uh, the challenge is having everyone in, in separate locations. I mean, there are ways to do it um, technologically where you can get somebody sort of on the same, you know, in the same, um, in a linear way, but, but with everybody's schedules and, and uh, lining up all of that, all of, you know, basically we should, make, we should make it clear to the audience that the actors in this and the future episodes are not all in the same room. Um, they're not even in the same state. Right. Um, right. Their voices are recorded at different levels. There are, uh, there are moments between their speeches uh, that have to be sewn up or spread apart. Um, uh, and I mean, I would sound as if it was being done uh, in the same room at the same volume uh, in one seamless take. And I got to pay tribute to Steve who has made that happen in ways that exceeded anything that I imagined when I, when I wrote this thing. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, line by line, every line had to be placed and silences were cut, breaths were reduced. You know, if somebody did that with their mouth and, you know, that, that had to go, um, that would be the, probably the biggest challenge. You know, music is second nature to me, but, but when it comes to editing and, um, you know, that's, that's a whole, I mean, no matter how you slice it, when it's dialogue, it requires some real, some real attention. So thank you. And, and uh, you know, it was, like I said, like I've listened to it. It's funny because every time I listen to it, I might be listening for certain things, but when, when I still hear the dialogue, it still kicks up feelings when I hear it because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a palpable, uh, 
especially for this one, it's a powerful storyline. So it's it's, oh. it's cool. It's cool. Uh, you're an artist in your way, as as I like to think that I may be in my way. Exactly. Exactly. So thank you. This is great, yeah. and uh, and I look forward to having this discussion with you and the other performers as we go forward. Yes, me too. Same. Thank you. This just in at the Creepery News Network. A hospital cardiac ward is the last place you'd expect to hear a political quarrel. For Roy Jansen and Stanley Fimster, it may well be the last place they hear anything at all. Here's the exclusive audio from the hospital. Ah, that explains it. Explains what? Your heart attack. God was punishing you for being a Republican. Republicans are the only thing protecting this country from left-wing radicals like you. You should get down on your knees and thank your benefactors. Ow! Oh, hey, who the hell are you pushing, you son of a bitch? Here's something to make America great again. Find out how this story ends this week at thecreepery.com.